en Burbuja. The 20s and 30s were the golden age of flying, if you were white. As a matter of fact, people today talk about the good old days. There weren't any good old days. These were the bad old days. There were no blacks in mainstream aviation. Among the air gypsies or barnstormers, there were a few. The life of an air gypsy was exciting and cruel. They usually ended early and violently. They flew for the glory of flying. The very first black barnstormer was a lady. Bessie Coleman was born in America, but earned her wings in France. In 1926, she was back in the States, only to meet the fate of so many other air gypsies. Opportunities in civilian flying were few. In the military, there were none. Since World War I, flying had become the glamour job of the armed forces and blacks just weren't getting those glamour jobs. They were allowed to fight with rifle and bayonet, but not to pilot the wonderful new flying machines. But, like everybody else, they could still dream. My father put me in an airplane in 1926 out here at Bowling Field. He paid five dollars to a barnstormer. The father of the young Ben Davis was a remarkable man. He was the only black colonel in the army on his way to becoming the first black general. But even more remarkable is where he had started. You know, he was uh, commissioned as a second lieutenant of cavalry in 1901. And how was he commissioned? He was an enlisted man in the 9th Cavalry. He had uh, taken an examination for regular army commission. His superior officers had thought well of him and had passed him on to a regional board at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, where he had impressed that board. And to everybody's surprise, my surprise even today, in 1901, the War Department recommended to the White House that he be commissioned as a second lieutenant, regular army of cavalry. Imagine any officer of any color rising from buck private to the rank of general. I don't know how he achieved it, actually. It's one of the greatest achievements that I can remember anybody having made, and he made it. But the brilliant officer had perhaps risen too far too fast. Like any red-blooded cavalryman, and he was, in fact, an accomplished horseman, Davis wanted to command troops. But blacks were forbidden to command white troops in the 20s. Davis was confined to desk duty and teaching for most of his career. And this embittered the general and his son. At first, Benjamin Davis Jr. wanted no part of the military. But a $5 ride on a barnstormer's plane changed his mind. I didn't want to be a, a teacher. I could have been a teacher. I could have been a doctor, a lawyer, if I'd wanted to. I didn't. I wanted to be a pilot. He might as well have wanted the moon and he had an ambitious plan to get it. Even the Army Air Corps would not turn down a black West Point graduate who was qualified and wanted to fly. And that is the only way I thought it was possible for me to go to pilot training. At the time, West Point had one single black cadet who was shorted to wash out. No black, in fact had graduated from West Point in this century. Congressman Oscar de Priest from Illinois wanted this record improved. I moved to West Point from Ohio so that I would be eligible for him to appoint me. He appointed me, and I entered West Point in, uh, on 1 July 1932. Davis soon learned why few blacks had succeeded at West Point. From his second day on, he was accorded the notorious silent treatment. He was ostracized. His fellow cadets wouldn't speak to him, wouldn't even acknowledge his existence. The feeling that was made apparent to me was that West Point wasn't for uh, black people. The silent treatment 
was effective psychological torture. Few endured it for very long. Davis endured for four years, all the way to graduation. Money and influence don't mean anything, whereas character and capacity mean everything. Well, that didn't apply to black people either. So, I was glad to be graduated, glad to leave. Davis left West Point, its first black graduate of the 20th century. But with triumph came a bit of disappointment. One year earlier, he had applied for pilot training. And it came back disapproved by the chief of the Army Air Corps with the stated uh, reason that there were no black units in the Army Air Corps and they didn't intend to, to have any. But the Army Air Corps didn't have the last word. The black press and liberal politicians did. By the late 30s, they were calling for a squadron of black fighter pilots. They saw the air as the testing ground for racial equality. The pilots of the Air Force were the elite people, period, in the country. The pressure was on to place young black men in that company. They, too, will have to be recognized as the elite of the society. The Great Experiment, it was called because so many believed it would never work. Uh, nobody believed, believe me, nobody believed that black people were capable of flying airplanes. The approach of the war was accelerating many military projects. This experiment included. By 1938, it wasn't so much a question of when, but of where. A base in New Jersey was proposed. So as Moffett Field in California, both declined. Neither could or would bear the additional air traffic. Finally, the decision was made to build an original airfield, this located near the small town of Tuskegee, Alabama. Why build a facility for blacks in the deep south? Some say it was intended to be one more obstacle to the program. In Tuskegee, failure would be certain. Others say it was to minimize negative publicity. In Tuskegee, failure would be obscure. The great experiment, it seemed, would be conducted in secret. As the airfield neared completion, a young West Point graduate was attached to it. This tall, erect, handsome black officer appeared in the door of my cabin. And he was a soldier. He was a soldier, and I think he was the right man, right place at the right time. Davis was about to undergo flight training. He would also take command of the newly designated 99th Pursuit Squadron. His dream of becoming a pilot was coming true. 